Good morning. Is everyone? <laughs> yeah, that's that's the good morning of people who have been to the beer party the night before, right? Um, I'm Stephen Hay. Some of you know me as Captain Flexbox. Yes, Captain Flexbox. I have to explain that. <laughs> Um, Brad Frost, I don't know, a lot of you probably know of Brad Frost, he, he called me Captain Flexbox and he started telling people to call me Captain uh, Flexbox. So a few, um, that's probably because I've written a lot and talked a lot about uh, the flexible box module um, in CSS, a lot of CSS layout stuff. And I was having dinner with Jason and um, sitting with Jason and uh, Brad. And <laughs> Jason's laughing right now. And so Jason didn't know what he was talking about. He said, Captain Flexbox. And I said, yeah, I'm Captain Flexbox. It's, it's like Batman. And Jason said, no. It's not like Batman. I said, yes, it's exactly like Batman. He said, no. And then he called me another name, which I won't mention here because they'll call it sexist on Twitter. And he said, um, if you don't own Captain we're going to start calling you this other name. So they, they threatened me. Okay, so now I'm Captain Flexbox. Okay? <laughs> Enough about me. Um, who is not from the Netherlands here? Wow. Okay, welcome to the Netherlands. Um, responsive design workflow. Uh, we have, we've heard a lot about web versus native. We're not going to talk about... Um, web versus native. This is only about web stuff, okay? And this is about workflow, which is not something we normally think about. We think about tools. We like playing around with technology. And workflow is one of those like things at the edge of what we do. It's process. And there are some people who really like process, but for a lot of us, it's quite unsexy. Um, so it's got an unsexy title, Responsive Design Workflow. I, at first, I wanted to call it Responsive Design Workflow is a douchebag. But then Jake came up to me and said, well, I really like that. Can I, can I use that? I could use the attention on Twitter. So uh, I said, go ahead, take, take it, take it. Um, so workflow may or, not be, uh, may or may not be exciting to you, but it is relevant right now. And it's relevant for designers. This is kind of a design talk. But I'm hoping that a lot of uh, developers can get something out of it uh, as well. Who here is a web designer? You would call yourself a web designer. OK, not all that many. How many hybrid web developer designers are here? OK, quite a few more. So I'm hoping everyone will get something, something out of this, even if it's just a, a small thing. Um, but it's more to give an insight into how I think we can change the process of designing websites and maybe web applications uh, today. So um, this, is, this is fun. Technology is advancing constantly, and we're designing for multiple platforms. So we're changing the whole result of our work. And the thing that we haven't been looking at is how we do this, uh, the, the workflow itself, which is slightly strange. So take this as an example. Let's say that, that you are the designer, maybe designer to developer, of the mobilism site, and PPK is your boss. Don't worry. Anyone who hasn't read PPK's articles knows that he's not critical at all. So he's really easy to work for. Um, so you made this, and if you're a designer like most web designers, you made this in Photoshop, right? In Photoshop, you have all the control of, of everything that you want. Um, or do you? Because PPK comes along, and he has some changes he wants made. So for example, he wants this headline. He wants it bigger. So for the people who work in Photoshop, how do you do that? How do you make that text bigger? What, what is that impact in this design, if it's a static Photoshop document? Anyone? No one? Well, usually, you'll make this bigger, and you'll have to move things down. And you move them down by hand. And so you'll, you'll grab these two things, you'll move them down. You might have to make your document longer so that you'll have space to move them down. You'll move this button down, and then you'll make these things bigger. And then you have, you have space for that, OK? And that's, that's one simple change. But PPK, 
being the boss that he is, says, I want these photos changed. I want those bigger. So you have to do the same thing again, okay? And this is only the home page. A lot of people make a lot of pages in Photoshop, so we're starting to see that it, the effectiveness of it is, is debatable. And now PPK says, well, this is mobilism and, you know, responsive design and stuff like that. So we want, we want to see what it will look like on a phone. We want to see what it will look like on a, on a tablet or at least one form of tablet. And we also want to see things like tables that we have. We want to see what those look like at different sizes. So what we would do in Photoshop is we would make, I'm guessing about maybe 10 different Photoshop documents. And as soon as PPK says, I want this changed, you have to go and change it in every single document. And the changes are usually not trivial. This is the workflow that we used to do, but when we only had one, one page. Um, Photoshop documents are pretty. So we show them to the clients and, and they're ooh and ah, and we're setting, them up, we're setting them up for disappointment, basically because it will never look as good as it does in Photoshop, right? I think we've all known that. So the, um, in years past, uh, designs I've done in Photoshop, I kept them so that when people ask to see some of the work I've done, I'm not going to show them the actual website because that looks like shit. So I'm going to show them the, the Photoshop document that I made and then tell them how the developer screwed it up, right? Um, there's an answer to this problem, and the answer is very simple, but it's also a hard pill to swallow, especially for designers, because designers are now going to have to start immersing themselves in some of the technology that, that you and, and I, as a hybrid developer, uh, are working with every day. And there's an aversion to that. So designing from the bottom up, which means designing from the content out, and this is a totally new way of looking at things. We're, lots of times we'll design from the, from the design in. Um, 37 Signals has written a lot about uh, designing the interface first and then figuring the rest out behind that. So this is a different approach, content out. And I'm not only talking about documents. James, uh, in his excellent presentation yesterday, was, uh, talks a lot about documents versus apps. Um, an app without content is nothing. So apps have content as well. You do things with the content, but apps have content. Everything has content. And if it doesn't, it doesn't exist. And lots of, uh, there's a lot of talk about content is king. Um, design is secondary to content, which is untrue. Content and form are two things that, that work together. And Paul Rand, who's the designer of the IBM identity and lots of other cool stuff, always said that design is the method of putting form and content together. And I think that's true. So these are two things you have to think of together, but it all does, it starts with the content. So we have to look at that. And nowadays, a lot of design decision making is based on technology because technology is really cool. So I have clients who've decided what kind of CMS they want, and then they want to like paste a design on top of that. And so I'm the annoying designer guy who asks annoying questions like, well, why did you choose the CMS? Does it have to be a CMS? So these are questions that we have to, we have to ask. The decisions that are made on technology um, limit our choices as to design. So I was uh, honored to be asked to contribute to a book for Smashing Magazine, Smashing Book 3. And you should buy it. You, if, don't buy it for my chapter. Just buy it to support these lesser-known people, like, <laughs> like Andy Clark. Who's, who's Andy Clark? Um, I was lucky enough to have Brian Rieger be my tech editor. And we had an email exchange with each other. And um, he said, one technique I've used for years is to design in text, not necessarily describing everything in textual form. And then he went on to say, which usually results in docs sounding oddly creepy. It puts the lotion on its skin. I was like, what the hell is he talking about? What does that mean? Uh, later, I found out that it has something to do with the silence of the lambs, but, you know, <laughs> whatever. So, 
going back, to, he, he came back to reality, and he said, essentially, what is the message that needs to be communicated if I was only able to provide the user with HTML, unstyled HTML? That's an interesting thing to think about. Um, what web browser does not support unstyled HTML? Anyone? I'm sure there's one, <laughs> but not many, okay? Unstyled HTML is portable and works everywhere, doesn't it? So we have this word for everything that's not desktop. What is it? Mobile. Right. Okay? And my clicker's not working. Um, so we have smartphones, and we have tablets, and we have desktops. but. Um, We've heard, yesterday we heard about televisions. Jason was talking about televisions. Today we heard about toasters, right? So uh, we have all these things like refrigerators. Um, what about the Smablet? Or Apple's version of the Smablet, right? So we don't know what's going to happen. So when we want to make stuff now, not knowing what's going to happen in the future, then we have to consider, consider these things. And HTML is, is one of the things that we need to consider, structured HTML as the base for everything that we're going to do. So that is kind of um, my frustration with workflow um, at this point. We'll describe that in just a minute. And it's also uh, the starting point for a new workflow, it's just structured content. So let's take a look at workflow now. Uh, this is not the workflow as it happens at your workplace necessarily. Um, it's something that I've seen as a, as a trend, if you will. This is the way that a lot of agencies work. We start off with um, some kind of information architecture. So at least this is content. Someone starts off looking at the content and figuring out how, how can we structure this. Um, we'll make diagrams of this because, of course, we have to have deliverables for our clients, right? Um, this is a, a very legitimate step in the process, and I think it's uh, absolutely necessary to do. And not all of this workflow is done by a designer. So everything I'm talking about today, this whole workflow, is a combination of people working together, which leads to a design. And information architecture is the beginning. And then we have interaction design. This is a tough one. Interaction design... Um, I find this tough because I think we're all interaction designers in a way. Every decision you make, even as a developer, can influence the interaction. So the, this is a wireframe, actually, you probably wouldn't know. And I, this is my biggest problem with interaction design today, is that many, and not all, interaction designers use wireframes like this as their deliverables. Wireframes used to be something very simple, and now um, that's how you can tell that it's a wireframe. That's the only, the only way you can tell. It looks like a complete product. So what are we presenting here? If it's a wireframe and it still needs to be designed, it kind of looks designed to me, this is a problem because we're reducing visual design to um, decoration, right? Design becomes like a color by numbers exercise. We just fill in the blanks. Put the logo in, put some color on, um, how many of you instantly know when there's a certain CMS being used behind a website? Just by, look at, just by the layout. I mean, everyone's seen it, I think. So you just look at, you're like, oh yeah, that's Drupal. <laughs> you know, or that's WordPress. Um, because it, all you have to do is change the colors. It's, it's too easy. But it's not design. Design solves problems. Design is thinking about a lot more things than just what something looks like. And so we've gotten into this situation where interaction designers are actually answering more design questions than visual designers, and visual designers are hired to make things look nice. That's not what they were trained for. Good visual designers, graphic designers, are, are trained in solving your problems. I would go so far as to say that I would like to see interaction designers and visual designers be combined into one job title, or at least have these people working together all the time and not have the interaction designer hand off something to a visual designer that then does their decorative magic and then um, 
you know, moves it along the assembly line that we've, we've uh, made through the years. In the beginning of, uh, of the commercial web, a lot of us were doing pretty much everything, which is also bad to do everything. But we've splintered things so much, and we've kind of made these micro job titles. And every single job title has to justify itself by making deliverables. So the simple wireframes weren't great to show clients, so now we've got these the, the kind of wireframes that I just showed. So enough of that. And nothing against interaction designers. Very valuable. I just think that there should be a... Uh, a mesh between interaction design and visual design. And at some places it is. I know Joni from PhoneGap came up to me um, the last time I gave this talk in Orlando, and she, she said, well, I'm somewhat offended by what you were talking about because I'm an interaction designer. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> um, but it was, she understood that I'm not insulting interaction design as a, as a field, um, but that I see that visual designers are just kind of... Um, House painters, you know what I mean? So I, I think that we need to get away from that and use the strengths of the graphic designers that we have hired um, together with the interaction designers and realize that we're all dealing with interaction design. So design is not decoration. Decoration is not design. And that's pretty much the workflow that I've seen. And there are little steps in between. Um, there are a lot of steps in between, actually. But when we're designing responsive websites, and I'm going under the assumption here that when you're designing a website today, that you are of the opinion that you might as well make it responsive. Uh, there's, I'm not saying responsive design is the answer. I'm just saying that if you're going to make a site and you're able to make it look good on several different devices, and um, you, even you're able to make, change the content on several different devices, then uh, why not? Okay, so if you're into that, if you do that, if you'd like to have a process for it, this is a process that I've developed um, over the past year and a half. And it's born out of frustration with, actually I had the first uh, client that came to me with these kind of Photoshop template things. That, and we had to make like, instead of five Photoshop templates or for the basic components, we had to make tons of these things. And, it just took months and months and months of changing little things in Photoshop, and it was very, very frustrating. And I thought, this is, this is just not the way <laughs> that we're going to be able to keep doing things. So I started thinking about how can we change this and used my own clients as guinea pigs. So everything I'm talking about today, from this point on, it, are things that actually work for actual, real clients. And uh, I do have an independent consultancy right now, but that does not mean that I have small clients. So these things have worked for clients that are small, but clients with thousands of people as well. Okay? They might not work for you. I'm not right. I'm not wrong. Um, some of the things might work for you and others won't. So it's just, the only thing I can do is tell you what I've found and hope that you get something out of it. You might get the whole thing or you might just get pieces. So, See what you like. There are 10 steps, and this is a test for all the, the beer drinking people from last night. Just uh, look at these, memorize them. Okay, done. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. These are them. I'm not going to name them because that's really annoying when people name all 10 things. I, I'm going to go through all 10 of them individually. So, the first one is content inventory. This is not a new step. This is something that hopefully almost everyone does today. And basically, you're figuring out what, what do I have in a site or on a page or um, in a module or what have you. Sorry, I'll step back into the light. Last year, I gave an entire presentation in the dark. Um, this is what we have on this page. So we've got navigation, we've got a logo, a date and location, um, media links, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is a very simple example of a conference that, um, that I was at about a month ago. And it's a simple example just to make the point. A content inventory in its base is just a list, a list of things that you have in the site. And content in that sense for an app would also be the, the widgets, the components. You can 
put those in there as content inventory. Okay, so not a really difficult step. The difficult part is figuring out what you're going to put in there, because you, basically you want to start with nothing and only add the things that you need. We'll get back to that later. And then we have something that I call uh, content reference wireframes. Um, this is a normal wireframe, or at least the types of wireframes that we see today. But this is what I mean with a, a content reference wireframe. If we were to have this type of page, before we designed it, we'd be thinking about how we'd, we would set up the page. This is a content reference wireframe right here. These things existed before. I didn't make this up. They, they were called schematics. They were called wireframes. This is how I knew. I, I knew these as wireframes when I started. Um, just thinking about what am I going to put where, just a little bit. What, what's kind of the, the structural hierarchy of, of this uh, thing that I'm building? And then referring to the content and not visualizing anything, just kind of getting a feel for the structure, just to, to start making it real. So it's a whole process. Um, these can be very valuable because you know how long it takes to make one of these? Like 10 seconds. So how many, if you want to do these iterations to figure out what feels better, you can make in about five minutes, literally tens or maybe even more than 100 of, of these things. They're kind of like thumbnail sketches. If you're designers, you know exactly what I mean. Just quick, quick sketches that actually give you an idea of what you're going to make uh, without having to put all the energy into it, OK? So here's the mapping. This at the top, the navigation, logo, and you get it. It's easy, easy, nothing to it. Um, so easy, in fact, that we would be tempted to say, well, you know, don't need it, don't need it. But it's, it's really important because as far as I'm concerned, this, will, this should take the place of the wireframes that we're making now that take days and days and days to complete in OmniGraffle. And we make them clickable so that the client has this feeling they're already going through the app or the website um, when we haven't even designed it yet. So how hard is it to change the mindset of a client who's already walked through something that looks almost built when the designer comes along and, and makes decisions that are actually better for the thing that we're making, but which uh, get rejected because the client's pretty much used to what they've, what they've seen? I've seen it tens of times. So the next step is what I think uh, I did. I didn't call it designing a text, but Brian Rieger calls it that, and I think that's a great term for it, designing a text. Just thinking about what text you have in there. You could cut and paste real text and, and put it in here. And again, this is a very simple example. And what I do is I just write this stuff down or copy and paste it and make markdown of it um, just so I can kind of show the client, look, this is, this is the kind of textual content that we're dealing with. And if, there, if there's got to be a little widget or a button or some kind of interaction, I'll, I'll put that in there too. I won't describe everything because it's like putting lotion on your skin or whatever. So um, Then I convert it to HTML, um, which I use Pandoc, which is very awesome. Um, and you can use whatever you want. You could even do it in HTML. It doesn't really matter. I do it this way. I start off with plain text so that the client doesn't see all kinds of tags and different elements. and They just see the text. And then I convert it to HTML. We're talking about basically we're working toward a static prototype. And then once it's HTML, open it in a web browser. And guess what? Structured HTML unstyled, and um, it works in every browser, everywhere. It works on your phone. It doesn't look like much, but it's OK. You've got your basic content based off of what your, um, what your client's wishes are. So this is an interesting point, because uh, if we look at the very first website ever, uh, which this is a copy of, it was mobile-ready, pretty much. It's kind of an arcane HTML syntax, so uh, doesn't work perfectly everywhere. Um, some things are kind of fixed, but this works uh, pretty much everywhere. And I'm pretty certain that Tim, Tim Berners-Lee did not have 
stock in Apple or know that uh, the iPad was coming or, or whatever. So this is what it looks like in, in a different browser. So. It, this means that HTML, for all its shortcomings, is for usual, like more document content purposes, uh, probably one of the better ways to structure your content right now because it's so portable. It's almost universal. I would say it is universal. And it's not the most ideal way to structure any form of content, but a lot of content can be structured with HTML. And with HTML5, a lot more content could be structured. It's just a little bit more confusing which elements you have to use, right? So you can port HTML. It'll be around for a long time. Uh, so you don't have to, to worry too much about that. My uh, consultancy is called Zero Interface, which people think is kind of a strange name. Sounds like a gaming thing or whatever. Um, but the zero interface is something that I used to talk about when I gave uh, some college lectures about user interfaces. And the zero interface is basically, I think about it, and then it's done. I think about ordering that book at Amazon, and think, done. It's done. Every step that I add to the zero interface is one step too many. So I have to evaluate every single step that I take um, and ask myself, is this absolutely necessary? Does it have to be uh, put in here? If it doesn't, leave it. Leave it out. Okay? And I'm not talking about making things simple for simplicity's sake or making them so simple that you're actually crippling the user. This is, um, this is a way to avoid feature creep, if you will. So it's just kind of a, a utopian idea, the zero interface. So this is something that I try to... Uh, tried to use when developing this workflow, starting off with structured HTML, and every single thing I add, visually or um, interactively or whatever, that it is absolutely necessary. So when you have that basic HTML, you can start styling it a little bit. Just see what happens. Play around. Design is exploration. Design is experimenting. It's uh, um, feeling. It's, it's, not, it's not all science. Uh, a lot of it's not science. So just start playing around with it. And it, it's helpful to play around on small screens. If you're one of the mobile first advocates, it's not really mobile first. It's structured content first. Just start, start designing that structured content. What I use Point five is uh, breakpoint graphs. Stephen Few made this uh, bullet graph specification, which I think is pretty cool because here we've got two things. Um, we're talking about the revenue, but this is this is pretty bad. That dark gray, bad, and the lighter gray is a little bit better. And the, this means pretty good. So we're talking about two things in one bar graph, basically. And it gets more complicated than this. But I really like the look of these. And I like that there was some kind of a, a graph specification which conveyed more information than you would expect in, in such a small space. So I started thinking, how could we map things that we want um, to do uh, for, our, for our websites or web pages or uh, apps or what have you? So this thing is called a breakpoint graph. And breakpoints, when we talk about breakpoints, we're mo usually we were talking about width, viewport width. And you can use that. So right now, these, uh, these points are actually um, pixel widths in this case. But it doesn't have to be pixel widths. It doesn't, it doesn't have to be widths at all. Um, I do use them because what I do is I tend to advocate a flexible layout, which changes in between each of the breakpoints. But at a breakpoint, um, it might change significantly. Something might change significantly. And what, what also is in here is HTML support, JavaScript support, and here somewhere you've got a hardware keyboard. The problem is I, I'm, not, I'm not done figuring this out. Um, so I want to write a specification, but I have to think a lot of stuff through. So you can see there's, there are a lot of problems with this. For example, um, hardware keyboard has nothing to do with 800 pixels. Um, it's just... So these two lines have nothing to do with each other. But it is, uh, it, it kind of, the, the idea is that you start off with your structured content and 
uh, if you're looking at viewport width, basically, you'll start expanding the browser. And there's a, there is a certain point where things will start breaking, and they'll look very bad. Um, and that's a point where you should put a breakpoint. At least for, sometimes it's for the whole page. Sometimes it's for certain components, or even just certain things that you'll say, OK, at this point, we want to change something, because it's not working anymore. So this is my attempt to kind of map out how I'm going to make these changes from, in this case, from smaller screen devices to larger screen devices. And I can imagine that you could make breakpoint graphs for um, other types of things, like uh, device APIs and um, you know, uh, device capabilities, and make some kind of a graph of that. So this is just a way to keep track of it so that we kind of document what we're doing and we're able to explain it to other people. When you, uh, when you design, you don't have to jump right into HTML, which is what I'm advocating here. You can sketch. You know, you're a designer. You're allowed to get a pen and paper and just sketch things out before you make them. But I am advocating jumping into HTML instead of jumping into Photoshop, which for a lot of designers is going to be uh, a big step. It's not that scary. HTML is not hard. CSS is quirky, but not hard. Um, and the world uh, will open up to you. If you're a visual designer and you've done any print work, then you know that you have to think about um, type of paper and what kind of ink and dot gain and um, undercolor removal and lots of crazy stuff. You have to know what your design is going to end up in um, when it gets to the printer. It doesn't mean you have to be able to print. So you don't have to be a developer, but you do have to um, know a little bit more about what's possible and what's not. And why not? We have this opportunity, which we couldn't do. I could not just print out when I did print design. I couldn't just print um, an advertisement in a magazine. I could print it on a printer, but I couldn't print a brochure or um, a book. I couldn't just make the book to see what it looked like. But we're in this position where we have this technology where we can publish instantly. It's the perfect opportunity for des designers to be able to just um, put something in and get something out exactly the way it'll look. Just see the exact page, you know, what it'll look like. So the problem is that we're used to delivering Photoshop documents. Uh, this is what, um, how many of you get Photoshop documents from a designer? Because a lot of developers here. And you have to, wow, yeah, a lot of you. So you have to translate those. So what do you do? I'm, I'm assuming that everyone goes in and you're like looking at, you select something and then you look at what color that's supposed to be, right? And then you put that into your CSS. Wouldn't it be better if you just got CSS with the colors already in it? Um, or, do you, or do you like focusing all your attention on going into Photoshop, selecting things and figuring out what color it is, or taking the ruler and measuring uh, how much space is bet between something and its pixels, and now you're doing responsive design, so you have to translate that to, to M's or to, to percentages. Um, not fun. Not fun for developers. Um, crazy for designers, because it's frustrating, because then they see something different than what they made in Photoshop. So I think the turn is for the designers right now to start uh, thinking differently. Um, but if you're not delivering in Photoshop, you still have to have some way of documenting what you're doing. Okay? So we work toward an HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever prototype. And this is the design. And it looks like you're, you might have the feeling, if you're a designer, you might have the feeling, well, why don't I just go ahead and build the whole site by hand? Because I'm, you know, we're doing this in HTML. I would say that if you take corrections into consideration and you get, you get good with this and you find your own methods to do it, that you can become faster than in Photoshop. I know people who are faster. I'm faster at doing this than I am in Photoshop. Um, it's because what we do is we work from those simple wireframes to this prototype. And you can, this is great for designers because you can show your clients what will happen in different devices. You can actually show this on a device. And it's on the developers 
to make sure that it's implemented correctly. They can't, the developers can't, can no longer say, sorry, crazy designer, it's not possible. We can't make that work in a browser. Um, yes, <laughs> we can, right? And it, no one's saying that the designers have to do this all on their own. I'm sure there are developers who would love to help their designers with, uh, with making these types of prototypes. So this is a design. We have the opportunity to create a design which actually works and looks like, um, like what it will be when we produce the end result, which is a unique opportunity, basically. It's also um, problematic in a way because we don't have a deliverable besides a prototype. So we can hand a prototype off to a developer, and a lot of developers would say, well, that's that's great, I'll just look in the CSS and I'll... Uh, uh, it's not really a, a template that we're making here. But, so it's kind of components that you put together on a page. That's what we have to remember too. These prototypes don't have to be just separate pages. Um, you have page types, but you also have lots of components that go into these pages. Uh, if for an app, you might only have one basic page or screen, and you'll have all kinds of components that will change depending on what the user interaction is. So you can just put all of these into one prototype, basically. Um, we start with the structured content. We start creating a linear design. We've made our content reference wireframes. And we work toward a prototype. Right? And this is with a talk that can only be about 40 to 50 minutes heavily oversimplified. Hopefully, hopefully it, it gives a, a different impression than what, how we've been doing things uh, lately. So we need to use things that developers use. Designers, when I, I'm, I'm, I was trained as a designer, and the world just opened up for me when I discovered all of these cool tools that developers were using. And I don't, I always say it's not about the tools, and it's not. But in a way, this is kind of a tool talk, because um, you guys and gals, as developers, have fantastic stuff, like version control. We, we didn't have version control. I would have loved version control. Uh, version control for Photoshop is, uh, is uh, I think uh, Adobe does have uh, version control for it now for the past several years, but we didn't used to have it. And it's fantastic. So it's easier, though, if you're doing everything in HTML than having, like, you know, gigs of uh, Photoshop documents. All these preprocessors and frameworks, which a lot of them I don't like. I'm usually anti-framework, um, with good reason. Um, HTML templating, static site generators like Jekyll and Hackle and uh, stuff like that. Um, and all these development approaches like Jonathan Snook's uh, Smacks and object-oriented CSS and that kind of thing. We don't have any of that in design. Design's like kind of stayed where it is, you know what I mean? And pe the people just make, make pretty stuff. And we need to get out of that and let designers do what they're really good at. So we should start using these tools. And hopefully, there are some design tools that developers could use as well. And basically, we need to all work more together and less in an assembly line fashion, especially the larger web companies that just kind of create silos. It doesn't work. It's not sustainable. So some presentation psychology. I've given way too many presentations uh, for clients. Um, and one thing I know is that you should usually, usually not present something the first time that you present, uh, which looks like it's done or almost done, because the client will think that it's really easy to make changes. And nothing is going to piss off your employees more than <laughs> if you keep coming back with changes. So for the first presentation, I really I have HTML and CSS prototypes, and I take screenshots of them, which seems weird to do. But I take screenshots. So I'll actually make the screen smaller, take a screenshot, just to approximate what it might look like on a smaller screen. That's how I, that's how I sell it. Um, and then see above, do, do screenshots. So the first presentation is a screenshot. So I will, I'm not lying when I say to the client, this is just an image, okay? 
It's just an impression. They don't need to know that I've done a lot of work in HTML and CSS and that it will be easy for me to turn that into a prototype uh, like magic. Okay, they don't need to know that. And what do we give to the developers um, as designers? And I think developers will be very happy if they have some decent documentation and don't have to go treasure hunting through a Photoshop document. And uh, Jeremy Keith, I, I saw this, and I'm glad he's here. I haven't had a chance to talk with him about it, but this is fantastic. This is such a great idea, which let me know that there are more people who struggle with the problem of, of being able to document and visualize components at the same time without just handing someone a, a prototype. The left-hand side shows the rendered HTML, and on the right-hand side you see the, um, the HTML that's used for that. I like the idea. What I was looking for was not exactly like this, but the idea started, started me thinking. And I saw something by Kyle Neath, who works at GitHub. Um, I think he's the design lead at GitHub. And he has something called KSS, which did kind of this for CSS. And um, I'm lucky enough to be able to hear more about that next week. But this was like, for me, um, the crucial missing piece of the new workflow. So I couldn't use it, though, because it's HTML, and I had to cut up my, um, my components into snippets, into separate documents. And I could probably script that, but um, you know, who, who wants to do that? So um, I found the Dexy, which um, I, I know all of you are going to secretly write down and go look at. Dexy is a very little known um, documentation system. And it's for documenting basically any, any language. Python, Haskell, Scheme, uh, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, whatever. You can document anything. So it's language agnostic, if you will. Basically, what Dexy does is it allows you to write actual human readable documentation and inject pieces of code into it. It will also, if you're more of a developer, you'll enjoy Dexy. Um, even if that's your only takeaway from this talk as a developer, is that you can put in live code, you can put little comment delineators which will extract that piece of code, put it into your documentation at the point that you want it, but it can also render, it could also run that code and take the result of the, the code that was run and put that in your documentation as well. And you're, you can use live code for that. So you don't, have to change, uh, you don't have to change your documentation when you change your code unless that's necessary. But you can change your code and it will automatically be changed in the documentation. This is fantastic. And for what I wanted to do, I wanted to document all these components that were designed. Talk about colors, typography, um, how we used white space, uh, anything you can think about that would help developers to, to developers to be able to implement a design. So I came up with something that, that looks kind of like this. And you've got, here you've got uh, rendered HTML, and here is the CSS, which actually um, is behind that rendered HTML. So it's not the HTML, it's, it's the CSS. And uh, better documentation than CSS, when it says margin bottom uh, 1M, I can't add anything to that, right? I, I can't write that in a more human readable way. So developers understand that. I don't have to do anything except put the CSS right next to it. Okay, so kind of kind of looks like this. And the first time I was experimenting with uh, with Dexy, I uh, I used iframes. There was a Dexy works with filters, so you can filter HTML through. Um, through the script which cuts your HTML into sections and uh, takes each of those sections and then puts it in an iframe and then puts it next to the CSS. I didn't like that idea, but there was no other way to do it. And then Anna Nelson, who, um, who develops Dexy, brilliant, uh, brilliant developer, um, she said, well, why don't you use uh, Phantom.js? And I was like, um, okay. <laughs> How do I do that? And she said, with Casper.js. So I don't know, who knows Phantom and Casper.js? 
Okay, Phantom is WebKit. It's a headless WebKit, so you can script it. You don't see anything. You just uh, can test, and you get these test results back. So it's usually used for testing, but you can make screenshots as well. And Casper.js makes it appeal to me as a designer because it's code, but it's not really hard to do. It's kind of like the jQuery for Phantom. Uh, so well, I, can t I can have uh, the script travel through my prototype and take screenshots of specific elements, pull those into the documentation, and then uh, pull the CSS that corresponds to that element and put them right next to each other, and then construct this documentation in that way. So this was perfect for me. It might not be perfect for you, but for me it was like the ultimate um, replacement for Photoshop documents. And this is pretty much how it works. I write my documentation, and I say where I want that piece of CSS and that, uh, that screenshot, and it just you know, builds automatically. When I change my uh, CSS, no problem. Re regenerate the, con uh, the documentation, and, and we're done. So I can't demo it now. So if you want, to, you want me to demo it, then you'll have to find me later on, because we, we don't have time. But basically, what you've made is a style guide, which is lots more useful than just a dusty old Photoshop document, OK? So this is it, really short. Actually, we need like a four-hour presentation to be able to get into these things in, in detail, but um, unfortunately. So the, it's not the perfect workflow. Uh, people have come up to me and said, uh, you know, I'm, uh, you can add this and this. And I'm like, yes, you can. Have fun. This works for me. Um, and add to it, take away from it. The whole idea of this is to just uh, rethink how you're doing things. We're, we're inventing tools, we're doing new, uh, we're making new apps, new products, new APIs, and everything, but we haven't really looked at how we work and how, especially designers, we haven't changed how we've worked in, in years and years. So all I'm saying is just to keep changing and keep learning. Thank you.